The next talk will be about branded content in the age of new media by the media director of the Middle East and North African region of Unilever, Esad Rahman. Please give him a hand. Good morning. How are we all doing? Woken up? What an exciting panel. I mean, seriously, how can I follow up um, such brilliance? I probably won't be able to do justice to the topic, and I start with that disclaimer to begin with. Uh, I mean, uh, amazingly, I mean, the kind of stuff that we just got talked about, you know, the wonderful stuff that our esteemed competition Nestle are doing, I was particularly impressed with what Marks and Spencer have done uh, with the web webisodes uh, initiatives, some really fantastic initiatives coming out of this region. And I think that's, that's what excites me personally. I'm not very old in this part of the world. I've only been here for 10 months, but seeing some fantastic work coming out of the Arab world actually makes me very, very proud. And I hope I can show you some of the work that we, as Unilever, are doing uh, in this part of the world and actually related to some, some you know, upstream thinking on why and how we think the world of content is changing. So. The, you know, this week was a, was a, was a milestone in the, in the world of content in the new media. Does anyone know there's a big milestone, a piece of content achieved this week? Does anyone know what that was? Any guesses? It's an old piece of content, but it achieved a new milestone just recently this week. No guesses. I'll, uh -huh. Gangnam Style. Gangnam Style actually hit 2 billion views. Now, 2 billion views is about 35% of the world's population, and this is massive. Imagine a piece of content coming out of South Korea and actually making it a global phenomenon. But that's not just that. 2 billion views in terms of the time the humanity spent watching that piece of content. There's a brilliant piece that economists put on their blog yesterday. Uh, about what, that, what could we do with that time. I mean, could you believe that you could actually build five and a half Burj Khalifas in that time and effort that we spent collectively watching Gangnam Style? And we could have built four more pyramids. I mean, we'd make Egyptians more happy if we build more pyramids, but you know, we could have built four more pyramids of Giza if we watching that time. So this insatiable thirst for content amongst the consumers actually is a very, very interesting phenomenon. Before we talk about tech, before we talk about uh, technology changing content, before we talk about anything else, I think what the, the most important thing we need to recognize is that the consumer pull for content is amazing these days. Oh, technology is facilitating that. The technology is making that all possible. But it is essentially your people, your consumers, who are actually making what we do possible. So very interesting. So because it's web, and when Economist actually put this blog up, they had some really interesting comments. And because it's The Economist, you had some really intellectual conversations going on. These are some of the uh, comments that were posted on the blog. I don't know if you can read it, but there's some really interesting ones there. My favorite, though, was the one which was almost three paragraphs long, four paragraphs long, and almost like an essay in itself, which basically said that The Economist is actually saying that the humanity is better off spending time building you know, buildings and rockets and tanks rather than actually having an intellectual discourse through art. I mean, way, way too intellectual for a simple analysis like that, but that's the kind of comment you get through web. What is happening in the world of content? There's a very simple theory. It's not mine. It came from Marshall McLuhan back in the 70s, before internet was born, before any interactive media was born. He said something really interesting. He said that the human mind has an inherent incapability to understand substance without giving it a form. And the, the easiest analogy I can give you in, in understanding what he means is that if you drink black tea in a you know, transparent glass where you're supposed to drink water in, it probably will not taste the same. And same for water if you put it in a cup of tea. And that's exactly what we think is happening to the world of content. You know, we use the word content as an umbrella term for a lot of experiences we're creating for consumers. So it's not just about saying, oh, I'm going to do a piece of webisode, put it online, and let's see, let's count the views, let's count engagement, let's count likes, you know, the discussions these guys just had. It's about really saying, how can you actually create experiences for consumers through these multi-touch devices and screens that have gone into uh, consumers' hands and lives? Uh, and actually give them something interesting and tell them an interesting story. And 
how are we doing that? How have we historically done that? First of all, what I wanted to establish in this room is that branded content isn't new. I mean, Viva, as Unilever, doing it about 110 years ago. I'm going to show you a brief film. This was shot by Lumiere Brothers, the inventors of cinema. Back in 1910, it was put uh, on display, and our brand, Sunlight, was actually there about 110 years ago in that film. Can we play the film, please? I don't know what people found interesting about uh, uh, you know, this film 110 years ago, but definitely the humanity didn't have as many entertainment options as we have today. So, so what really is new about uh, the, the world of content and how technology and new media has actually affected it? So I'm going to go through some really broad trends, and then I'm going to talk about some of the stuff that we're doing as a result of those opportunities arising in front of us. So first of all, I think one of the biggest trends that has happened is the fact that the content has unbundled. Now, it's a very interesting phenomena to understand. Um, I mean, obviously, given birth by likes of the Pirate Bay, Hulu's of the world, Shahid is doing similar work here in this part of the world, Netflix, iTunes, etc. What that basically means is that if I want to watch a particular episode of a particular piece of content, I do not have to subscribe to an entire package of OSN to be able to do that. I can just completely unbundle that piece of content and actually watch it on any device, anywhere I like. That's a very, very, very interesting phenomena because it has amazing amount of implications for content creators, it has amazing amount of implications for content distributors, and it has even more amazing amount of implications for advertisers. This was posted by Netflix CEO a couple of weeks ago. And according to him, this whole phenomena of unbundling would actually lead to the death of television advertising. Now, we don't like to hear that. How would we like to hear that? I mean, we built our entire business on the back of TV advertising. You know, we're one of the biggest advertisers in the world. Uh, we never like to hear that kind of stuff. So what do we do to survive? What do we do to sort of, you know, take care of it? I'm going to talk about it in a minute. Um, another thing that has happened, while the content has actually unbundled, the content has actually rebundled. So I don't know if some of you would probably recognize the icons on the screen, and you, some of you are probably heavy users of this, but there is a whole phenomena of aggregators and platforms like Hulu and Shahid and iPlayers of the world actually creating a layer of personalization delivery to the consumers. So the way the content's rebundling itself is actually dictated by the consumer habits and desires to watch a certain piece of content. So this whole rebundling is affected completely by technology, data, my ability to understand you as an individual and see exactly what you as an individual are looking for, and then actually packaging and delivering that to you. Again, it has amazing amount of implications for advertisers, it has amazing amount of implications for content creators and distributors alike. Third thing that has happened is that the ease of publishing content that we have today has never existed in the past. You know, there's, there's a phenomenon that a lot of people used to talk about that um, content creators are becoming publishers themselves, and it's true, but I think there are platforms like YouTube and Amazon, et cetera, who've come and actually established that the middleman will stay alive, but the content creators have become very close to actually almost becoming publishers, and they have a lot more control on publishing. So things like, if you take the phenomena of U-turn out of Saudi Arabia, I'm sure some of you know about them. There are a bunch of guys who actually started creating pieces of content online on YouTube, and now each one of their webisodes you know, gets about 40, 45 million views, and that's a phenomenal number of interactions. Um, you know, NBC Universal bought Comcast, which is a cable operator. The, on, the only, and it's considered one of the biggest mergers in the history of media industry around the world. The reason that happened was the content creators wanted to be close to publishing. They wanted more control on the publishing and distribution of the content. You can now go and actually live stream and premiere movies if you want. The Dark Knight was actually uh, streamed live on Facebook. It became a big phenomenon. This happened a few years ago, but it was big. 
Amazon Kindle Singles is a phenomena whereby if you have written a book, and I was amazingly listening to a conversation just behind, happening uh, at the table behind me. One of the guys sitting on that table has apparently written a book. But if you have a desire to write a book, and if you have written a book, you don't have to go through the whole uh, you know, shebang of going through editors and publishers and stuff. You can actually go and directly publish it on Amazon Singles. Amazon will keep a penny of whatever you make, but they will actually give you money back on whatever you sell. It's up to you how you market that. You know. Uh, so these all, all of these things are, you know, have massive implications for how we deal with traditional content producers and players, and how we deal with the new, younger, uh, and, and upcoming uh, sort of uh, generation of content creators. Very interesting. The second thing is, uh, and this is something the panel talked about as well. Uh, content has historically been evaluated on the cost of production. It's no longer so. Content is actually evaluated in the social velocity it has the popularity it gets, the sharing it gets, the, you know, the, the way it gets talked about, etc. And this is a very simple example. I love talking about it. 50 Cent invested in a company. He had 10% share. He sent 140 characters worth of content out on Twitter. He made $10 million out of that. And that's the value of content. That's the value 140 characters can generate for you. Now, a lot of people come and ask you, what's the tweet worth? What's a Facebook post worth? You know, what is the worth of a content? That's the worth of a content. That's how you evaluate. You evaluate by, via the return on the business that particular piece of content generates for you. Uh, data is, everybody's talked about, I'm sure it's the biggest topic of uh, 2014, everybody's talking about data, but data is also creating some really interesting forms of storytelling. I'm not sure, the two examples I have on the screen, I'm not sure if you can see those uh, properly, but the one on your right is an example of somebody really geeky picking up two and 25 million posts out of Reddit and actually organizing them uh, you know, in the order of engagement and uh, readership they've got and really ranking them and present, representing them to the viewers. It's very geek looking, you know, probably normal people like me would probably know, not go and actually click on all the links, but hey, there's something like that is already happening. On the left, there's another very interesting uh, phenomena that somebody created, which was, you know, essentially a collection of all Enron emails put on a portal for you to read as a story. So when the, when the Enron fall happened, someone had access to a collection of emails going around inside the company, and they put it up on web for you to read. Now that's an interesting form of storytelling and content, right? And it's all possible because people had access to that data, people had access to um, you know, stuff that they could turn in that, uh, into a story. Brands need to do content. We hear a lot about that, and we have uh, some of our key partners in the room, like NBC and DMS and stuff that we do uh, business with very actively with, and you know, we have a desire to become part of the content creation process these guys go through. But there's, what, the fact that I want to establish in this room is that brands will always want to get closer to content creators, but there's a limit to what the brands can actually do. And it's a very simple statistic. The size of the entertainment industry is four times the size of the ad spend industry around the world. So there's only, uh, there will always be a limit to what can be ad funded. So my request to my esteemed partners here is when you come to us with proposals, be realistic. Don't ask us to fund the productions entirely. We will not be able to do that. <laughs> but uh, this is a very interesting phenomenon because, you know, everybody talks about brands as publishers, brands in real-time marketing. But hey, what, you know, yes, we are ch taking out more money for branded productions and stuff, but there is a limit to what we can. We can't take up the responsibility of entertaining the entire humanity on our own. And, and the publishers and the distributors will always play a huge role in that. So how are we making the most of some of these developments uh, and opportunities? There's some really interesting work we've done. There's a, there's a mantra we have, uh, a three-piece mantra at Unilever, which becomes the basis for any consumer experience or campaign we create, which is very simple. We put people first, and when you talk about consumers, we don't call them consumers, we call them people because they're people. You know, the moment you call them consumers, you start to think of demographic groups, 18 to 24, you know, a woman who sits in a household, has two kids and stuff. But when you talk about people, you become more human about them. You start to think of ideas that are more human and more personal and more intimate in nature. The second mantra we have is build brand love. You know, we all talk about brand equity and equity scores and preference scores and conviction scores and all of that. But in, the, in this today and age where, you know, where consumers decide to see your ad or your message on their own, 
um, you know, you have to decide um, how well you sort of interact with them and unlock the magic. I'm being told that I have very little time left, so I'm going to quickly bust through some of the stuff. I'd love to show you some of the pieces of work we've done. There's a partnership we've created with U-Turn. I would love to play a video of that to showcase you how we're actually, uh, you know, creating this wave of going and working with uh, some of the content creators that are out there and who are making the best of themselves using platforms like YouTube, etc. Can we play the video, please? أعزائي المشاهدين كلوس اب قرروا يدعمونا بعدنا موهوبات انك تعرضوا تصاميمهم على صفحة لوكس بيوتي كالوري ما في شيء لفين ماي نيم از بيدر فور مين شكرا لكل شخص صوت مسابقة كلوس اب ما شاء الله مرتب موحد الله كم تسوير بحث قلت لك ما في موهوبات حلينا الموضوع أتعلم أن الزهاز من حمل الكلام اللي يجعل؟ ودع الملل يجب على أحد الوالدين تفريش أسنان الطفل هو هذا الكلام أنا هذا هو البازلين هذا كريم بازلين حق الرجال أنا من أول قاعد أتعب منه Um, again, I'm, I'm short of time. I've probably taken a lot of time talk about, talking about the theory, but I'm, I really want to show you another example of uh, this launch we did for Duff for Men. And men are generally not known to be very sort of caring human beings, although we are. Um, but this is really inter it was a really interesting channel challenge for us. We were launching a brand that's traditionally been known to be a female brand. And how do we start to sort of really position it for, women, for men? And how do we bring the brand essence out, uh, the caring brand essence out? So can we play? Quickly play the video, please. Hi, Zabe. I know you're surprised, but this surprise is meant for you. I'm coming on 70 mm screen just to show you how much I love you. It's been nine years we have been married together, but nine years seems to be like nine days, honestly speaking. I want to say thank you to my daughter and son. They are remarkable kids, wonderful to be with. I love you all. I just want to tell to the whole world today that I'm so blessed having you in my, in my life. I'm so blessed having you in my life. قليل عليك شو ما حكيت لك انه بحبك وبقار عليك وبنت فيك كله قليل شو ما كان قليل عليك ريم بهالمناسبه حاب اشكرك على كل على كل لحظه وقفت فيها معي Remember what I talked about using all sorts of screens. We not only created the experience on the biggest screen possible, but we also took that experience online. And this video, within, I guess, about 30 odd days, had 2 million organic views, which is fantastic media value for us. I am 
not going to take you through more studies, but if I have, do I have time for one more video? Yeah? OK, cool. Um, the one case study that I'm very particularly proud of, because it's something that sort of, you know, came born out of the Axe campaign globally. You know, Axe is traditionally a brand that has a very interesting positioning internationally, but we have to obviously, for cultural reasons, have to position it slightly differently in this part of the world. Uh, and, and we c come up with interesting ways of doing it. So, you know, within, in, I don't know if you guys saw that campaign and stuff. This video is slightly old. It was shot while the campaign was still on. For, for We submitted it for the FEs. Uh, but, you know, you'll have an idea of what we did with that campaign. And I, I, it's personally one of my favorite case studies from this part of the world. Can we play the video, please? Uh, the Axe video. The Burj Khalifa. Standing 830 metres high has always towered over anything else that has tried to come into the region and capture attention. So when Axe Apollo landed in the Middle East, it was one small step for man and one giant leap for 16 to 24 year old mankind. After landing, the astronauts made their way through cities in the Middle East. From there, the story took off like a rocket. Our now suddenly large online fan base was wondering when they would see the astronauts for themselves. Hi guys, this is James. When are you going to see the astronauts? So we briefed in 15 teams of astronauts on 51 submissions, each of which was designed to maximise public exposure. At the same time, we sent in a special unit of astronauts to invade Media City in Dubai, just so media professionals would also spread the word. Acer also sent in the unit into the heartland of our target market, nightclubs. The astronauts danced, charmed, and flirted their way around Dubai's best night spots. During this, we ran the Astro Hunt promotion, a simple competition which had the public sharing their photos on Twitter under the hashtag Astro Hunt. One person's photo received over 10,000 retweets. With the market now buzzing about Axe Apollo, we launched straight into Phase 2. This included the G4 Space Orb, which gave consumers the chance to experience the pressure of blasting off into outer space. We sent an astronaut admiral into cinemas, his entertaining speech proving that not even Brad Pitt beats an astronaut. The Astro Metro, a giant interactive art installation piece, was constructed inside Dubai's metro stations. We sent a digital photo booth out into the public, giving everyone a chance to get their photo with an astronaut. And to support all this, we used a galaxy's worth of above-the-line advertising. We even added a kiss mark to the global creative, a subtle reminder of what Axe Apollo is really about. Of course, popular radio stations kept debriefing the public of what was happening and where it was going to happen next. With so many white-collar high flyers concentrated in the JASA area, our astronauts went around letting amused professionals know that even if you're a CEO, you still won't beat an astronaut. Internally, Axe Apollo debriefed Unilever staff via a series of ongoing reports. We even created a dubstep music viral. And the impact we made in stores was as big as an asteroid. The highlight piece was the Axe Apollo promo pack. Its design was inspired from NASA's robotics department. All of this will culminate at the grand finale, a massive Axe party where finalists from Egypt, Kuwait and the UAE will compete for one of three places at the Axe Apollo Space Academy in Florida. Although the campaign is still only halfway through, the early returns are out of this world. In fact, in the last few weeks, Unilever Golf Dios took over leadership in the market with Axe Apollo leading the way. And with still over a month to go, we can expect sales to continue to rocket up high, higher even than the Burj Khalifa. So, you know, this is, this is the kind of stuff, um, you know, we, we love doing. Like I said, use content opportunities, they're everywhere, but how do you actually sync them to create something which becomes a holistic experience? And we really think, because of what's going on, because of the coders who were here early this morning, and because of the amazing technology enthusiasts that you would come across outside, and the changes that they're sort of doing to our ecosystem and the interruptions they bring to our business, it's the most exciting time to be alive as a marketer, and I, we hope to make the most of it. Thank you very much. Cheers.